Hello everyone and welcome to today's sixth grade ELA lesson. I have created a PowerPoint for today's lesson, so I'm going to share it with you all. And so the topic for our lesson is integrating multiple sources. So our learning goal is I can demonstrate coherent understanding of a topic or issue using information from various media slash formats. So basically this means that we'll be able to gather information from different sources such as books or essays or pictures or pie charts or graphs, things like that, gathering information from different sources on a certain topic to enhance our understanding of that topic. And so the materials you will need are paper and pencil, as well as informational books if you have them. So an informational book is basically true facts about a topic. So if you have a book that talks about butterflies or how chocolate is made or the game of soccer or things like that, those are all informational books. So on today's agenda, first we are going to review some vocabulary terms and definitions. Following that, we will integrate multiple sources for the topic of World War II Navajo code talkers. Following that, we will integrate multiple sources for the topic of polar bears, and then we will recap and conclude our lesson. So our vocabulary term is media or formats, which is basically how the content is presented. So when you have a topic, the content can be presented in a number of ways. You may learn about the topic from pictures with captions or from charts, graphs, books, essays, etc. There's a lot of different formats through which we can learn about the topic. So the first topic that we're going to learn about is the Navajo Code Talkers of World War II. So I have a question for you all. Two questions actually. Should differences be respected? For example, if someone speaks a different language than you, should we still respect them? And the answer is a resounding yes. It's always important to respect people who are different from us or may speak a different language or have different opinions, those kinds of things. We should always treat other people with respect. So we are going to learn about the Navajo code talkers of World War II through several different formats and sources. And our first resource is actually going to be an essay. Okay, so. We're just going to read through this essay for the purpose of understanding a little bit more about the context of Navajo code talkers and the role that they played in World War II. Let's read it together. The story of Navajo code talkers, their incredible role in World War II. If someone told you that the language you spoke had no value and that you should never speak it again, and then years later, you were told that your native language had great value and was needed to win a war, what would your reaction be? Perhaps it would be anger, frustration, or even confusion. Perhaps you would refuse to help the very, few pe the very people who ridiculed your native language because they had previously disrespected it. This scenario happened to the Native American people of the 1900s, whose lives were changed forever, as the government of European white people established laws that reduced the number of livestock, which are animals, the Navajo could keep and required their children to learn English. Forced to go to boarding school taught by the Bilaganas, which was the Navajo name for white people, Navajo boys and girls were told that their culture and beliefs were foolish and that they were to never again speak their Navajo language. They were to learn and speak only English. When teachers overheard the students speaking their native language, so their Navajo language, the students were promptly punished. Thus, the Bilaganas hoped to make the children completely forget the Navajo language. Fast forward to the middle of World War II, 1941 to 1942. America and her allies, allies are the people who are on America's side. So America and her allies, France, England, the Soviet Union, and China were deep in battle against the Axis, which were Germany, Italy, and Japan, in an effort to defeat Hitler, a German leader who wanted to destroy the entire race of Jews. For America and her allies to win the battle, though, it was not enough to simply send the troops into battle. The Germans were masters at eavesdropping on the phone calls the Allies used to communicate battle plans to each other. Clearly, 
a different communication alternative was needed. Back in World War I, the Choctaw and Cherokee people had found a way to communicate to troops through a code, which was immensely successful. As detailed in a letter from one officer to another, rejoicing in the fact that the German enemy could not translate the code talker sentences to understand the plans being communicated. So in other words, this code was effective. The enemy wasn't able to break the code. The leading officers of World War II decided to try a similar tactic or strategy. They recruited Navajo men, some of whom had been told years ago in boarding school to forget their language entirely. Now the language the white people had banned was the very same one needed to succeed in the war. About a fifth of Navajos came from reservations to enlist in World War II, motivated by their patriotism, their love for America, and poverty, as so many of their livestock, that means their animals, had been taken away. In addition to receiving basic military training, the first 29 code talkers worked together to develop a Navajo code, one which the enemy would not be able to translate. They had to keep their code a top secret. They could not write it down or tell it to soldiers who were not code talkers. The code talkers communicated orders, battle plans, and changes over a radio in their native tongue, as numerous pictures from the time show, such as one picture of two cousins doing this. Even after the war, the code talkers' contributions were still largely unrecognized, and they were told that their unbreakable code might still be needed for future wars. Years later, Navajo code talkers finally gained the recognition they deserved as President Ronald Reagan officially made August 14, 1982, the first National Navajo Code Talkers Day. Today, the dictionary of words used in the code can be easily accessed. Why should we care about the Navajo story? Why does it matter? The answer is this. If the Navajo code talkers had not developed a code, then the US and its allies, so the people on its side, would not have had a reliable way to communicate secret battle plans to each other. Many, many lives would have been lost, but were not because of the code talkers' rapid communication methods. Thus, the code talker saved many lives during World War II, thus lowering the overall catastrophe rate a debt America can never fully repay. Learning about the Navajo code talkers and their important role in World War II helps us to also learn about our nation's past. Knowing the full story, the entire historical truth, not just bits and pieces, is very important. The United States owes a lot to the Navajo code talkers of World War II, and their stories will live on for many generations yet to come. All right, so through that essay, we learned a lot about the Navajo code talkers. So now we have some good context. So when we view our next resource, this one is excerpt from letter from the commanding officer to the commanding general. All right, so let's review this one now, and this will kind of help us to further enhance our knowledge of the Navajo code talkers because this is another source and every source can give different information, new information. So now we're building our understanding of the Navajo code talkers. All right, so let's read this one, which is an excerpt from the letter. In terms of communication, the telephone presented the greatest possibilities. However, the Germans were a past master in the art of listening in. There was every reason to believe every decipherable message or word going over our wires also went to the enemy. We felt sure the enemy knew too much. It was therefore necessary to code every message of importance. Encoding and decoding took valuable time. Navajo men from the Choctaw tribe were asked to create an unbreakable code, which was a success. The enemy's complete surprise is evidence that he could not decipher the messages. We were confident the possibilities of the telephone had been obtained without its hazards. Okay, so I have two questions here. 
So my first question, and this is where you're going to need your paper and pencil, you don't have to copy down the questions, but definitely write down your answers. Okay, so the first question that I'm going to ask you is, according to the letter, why were Navajo code talkers needed? Why wasn't the telephone good enough? So I want you to list at least two reasons. So again, why were Navajo code talkers needed? And why wasn't the telephone good enough? All right, so on your piece of paper, I want you to write down Navajo code talkers were needed, and then some space. So I'll let you pause the video and write that for Navajo code talkers were needed, and then some space. So you can pause the video. All right, and then you can write on your piece of paper, the telephone wasn't good enough because, so you can pause the video and do that as well. Awesome, okay, so now I'm gonna let you take another look at the letter so that you can write down your two reasons for why the Navajo code talkers were needed and why the telephone wasn't good enough. Okay, so you can pause the video so that you can reread this and then answer the questions on your piece of paper. All right, great job. Okay, now we're going to go on to the second question. The second question says, explain why it was important for the Navajo's messages to be communicated in a short amount of time and to not be able to be understood by the enemy. So again, explain why it was important for the Navajo's messages to be communicated in a short amount of time and to not be able to be understood by the enemy. So I'll let you pause the video and write your answers to that question. All right, so after you've written your answers to both questions, it is time to check our work. And your answers may look completely different, and that's fine as long as they follow a similar, a similar understanding of it. Okay, so for example, for according to the letter, why were Navajo code talkers needed, and why wasn't the telephone good enough? One reason could be, well, the Germans were past masters at listening into phone calls. And besides, coding and decoding took valuable time. And so if you used research, you could have also found out some additional facts about the Navajo code talkers. That could have been another really great source, but research wasn't required. So based on your letter, you should have at least two reasons. And so the telephone wasn't good enough because the Germans were already able to kind of eavesdrop on the conversation. And so that wouldn't have worked. What the people really needed was an unbreakable code. And so that's what the Navajo code talkers provided. So this was very effective. And it even said in the letter that the enemy was completely surprised, which is evidence that he could not decipher the messages. So he wasn't able to tell what the messages were really saying. All right, for our second question, explain why it was important for the Navajo's messages to be communicated in a short amount of time and to not be able to be understood by the enemy. So this answer was not found directly in the letter, but if you think about it, it's kind of important for the messages to not be able to be understood by the enemy so that the enemy doesn't know what the Americans were planning. That way the Americans can kind of capture the enemy by surprise. So if your answer was similar to that, then that also works really well. So great job. Okay, so I have another resource to further help us understand the Navajo Code Talkers of World War II, and this resource is the Navajo Dictionary. So years and years and years later after the war, the Navajo Dictionary was finally made accessible to everybody. So now we can kind of take a look at it. So we have the word in English, all of these, and then we have the translation into Navajo, which is all of these. And then same for this one, we have English words translated into Navajo. All right, so this is our Navajo Vocabulary Dictionary. So I'll give you a few minutes to just look this over if you want. For example, accomplish is like also, and then this is D and like other ones. So it's a really cool dictionary. And so my question to you is, looking at the Navajo Dictionary, 
analyze the following. Why would it have been hard for someone who is not a Navajo to understand and speak the Navajo language fluently? And I'll read it one more time. Why would it have been hard for someone who is not a Navajo to understand and speak the Navajo language fluently? So I'll let you pause the video and write down your answer. So one possible answer could be, well, it might be hard to pronounce the Navajo language. Like for example, this word for our English activity or this word for address and things like that. It looks like the pronunciation might be a little bit difficult or should I say very difficult. And so it might be hard for someone who is not a Navajo to pronounce the Navajo language. And besides, some of the words also have many syllables. We take this word, for example, for thereafter. This is quite a few syllables, and so that can also be another reason why it would be hard for someone to understand and speak the Navajo language fluently. So it's a very good language to help with the unbreakable code during World War II. All right, and so if you had answers that were similar to this, then that is also perfectly fine. So great job. All right, now I do have another question for this Navajo vocabulary dictionary resource. And the question is, using the dictionary as a guide, translate the following sentence from English to Navajo. And the sentence is advance together. So again, what you're going to do is you're going to use this dictionary. And you're going to translate the following sentence from English to Navajo. So you're going to find out in the dictionary where it says advance and then write down the Navajo translation for advance. And then you'll find where it says together and write the Navajo translation for together. And then I'll say advance together, but in Navajo. So I'll give you time to pause the video and translate the sentence from English to Navajo for advance together. Awesome, so let's check our work. So, advance together is this lovely phrase right here, and we found it by first looking for advance. So we have, hmm, where is advance? Advance is right here. So we have it, I think it's pronounced nos se. So we wrote down nos se for advance. And for the word together, 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 right here, together. Tabil, I think that's how you pronounce it. So we've got nos se tabil which means advance together. All right, so if you had this answer, then you are good to go, awesome. All right, I have another resource to help us further understand the code talkers, and this resource is a picture of some code talkers. So, we have Preston Toledo and Frank Toledo. They are Navajo cousins in a Marine Artillery Regiment in the South Pacific. And in this picture, they are relaying orders over a field radio in their native tongue. So these two men right here are cousins, and they're relaying orders over a field radio right here in their native tongue, so in the Navajo language, using that unbreakable code. So my question to you is, the two men in the picture were both cousins. Evaluate whether it was a good idea for relatives and family members to be placed with each other, or if they should have been separated. Explain your reasoning. So for this one, I just want to say really quick, there is no right or wrong answer, like whether you decide that it is a good idea for relatives to be placed together, or if it would have been better for them to have been separated. Those are both completely valid answers. What I'm looking for is for you to explain your reasoning, so to kind of support your stance. So it's kind of like an opinion statement that you'll be giving. So again, you'll be evaluating whether it was a good idea for relatives and family members to be placed with each, with each other, or if they should have been separated. And you'll be explaining your reasoning. So I'll let you pause the video and start that assignment. All right, so here is my sample answer. And I kind of took both perspectives. So, on one hand, relatives should not have been put together 
because if one family member died, then the other family member might be affected. Like that family member might mourn a lot and then not be like as actively involved or just invest as much of himself in the, in the military if he knows of a family member who died. But then on the other hand, if family members and relatives were put together, then they could support each other and cheer each other up and just have that familial bond. So again, both sides, no matter what side you took, both sides are valid. I was just looking for you to explain your reasoning. So great job on that one. All right, next question. Predict three possible messages that the code talkers in the picture might have been communicating to their comrades. So what do you think are some phrases or messages that they might have been trying to communicate? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. It just has to be messages that are in the context of the military. So messages that they might be sending the troops who are in battle right now. So you're gonna write down three possible messages that they might have been communicating to their comrades. So let you pause the video and do that. Okay, so three possible messages might have been, enemy is 20 miles away, or beware of traps in forest, or enemy territory ahead. And you could have completely different answers and that's perfectly fine, as long as they have that military context. Maybe they're warning the troops about what to, what to expect when they arrive, or they're saying the enemy is a certain distance away, or enemy territory is ahead, or approaching enemy territory or things like that. There's a whole bunch of different answers. All right, so I also wanted to include some references. And so I got a lot of the material from the essay from a novel that's called Code Talker, a novel about the Navajo Marines of World War II. And then I got the picture that you just saw from Code Talkers from the National Archives. And I got the letter from the commanding officer as well. So I cited that source. I also got the Navajo Code Talkers Dictionary that I showed you earlier, as well as a book which is called A Different Mirror, A History of Multicultural America. And I highly recommend reading this book if you ever get a chance, it is an excellent book. And so it's always important to cite your resources, cite your references whenever you are presenting to someone. It's important to say where you got your information from. So that's what I did here by citing all of my references. All right, so key takeaways for the Navajo Code Talkers. It's very important to respect diversity, so respect people who are different from ourselves, because we can learn many things from people who are different from ourselves. And we also have things in common with other people. So all important things to remember. And there is something optional. So if you would like to do this, if you would like to talk more about the Navajo Code Talkers in your writing, then it is optional for you to write a reflection on what you learned about the Navajo Code Talkers and about why it's important to respect people who may be different from yourself. So again, this is totally optional. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But if you do want to, then I encourage you to pause the video to write the reflection. But again, no pressure whatsoever. It's completely your choice. All right, so I do also have some questions about the Navajo Code Talkers. So the first question is, Explain why it was important for the Navajos to communicate messages in a very short amount of time. So I want you to write down the answer to this question. Explain why it was important for the Navajos to communicate messages in a very short amount of time. So a sample answer might be, when they are fighting battles, the men or troops need to know how to withdraw, or they need to know to withdraw right away or to advance. This can save many lives. So basically they have to have communication going so that they know what their next step should be. Now if you had something different, a different answer, that's also perfectly fine, as long as your answer makes sense too. All right, next question. Analyze why it would be important that the Navajo code talkers memorize all dictionary and all code words during training instead of writing them down. So let me pause the video and answer that question. All 
All right, so a sample answer could be, it was important for the Navajo code talkers to memorize the code so that the enemy could not get a copy of the code to prevent the wrong person from receiving it and then reporting it to the enemy. And if you had an answer similar to this one, that is awesome. Now I did want to add a quick note about the Navajo code talkers, which is that despite their valuable contributions, the Navajo code talkers were actually very much unrecognized after the war. That's because the military told the code talkers that their code might be needed in future wars, future conflicts, and the code was classified until 1968, and then recognition came slowly. So in the end, the first National Navajo Code Talkers Day was August 14th, 1982. Okay, so our next topic is going to be integrating multiple sources for polar bears. So our first source is going to be from a magazine article. This one is taken from Highlights, the November 2005 version. And the title is Finding Polar Bear Dens, and it's by Jack Myers, who earned a PhD and is a senior science editor. So let's read it together. Mother polar bears give birth to their cubs in dens they have made by scooping out hollow spaces in snowbanks. As people search for oil in Alaska, scientists have a problem finding the dens so polar bears can be protected from road building and oil drilling. Solving that problem is a new story on how discoveries in one part of science help progress in another part. Mothers and Cubs. A denning polar bear puts out about as much heat as a 200 watt light bulb. That's enough to protect against the extreme cold outside the den, but not enough to make a toasty warm inside, not even to melt the snow blanket over the den. Inside, the cubs begin their lives in temperatures just above freezing. Even so, that little extra heat from the mother can show as a slightly warmer spot in the snow above the den. There's a neat way to tell the temperature of any object from the amount and color of the radiation it gives off. The sun is an extreme example. Because it is so hot at thousands of degrees, we can see and feel its radiation as sunlight. Every object gives off radiation depending on its temperature. For most objects, this radiation is such a dull red that our eyes can't see it. We call it infrared radiation. Scientists have gotten better and better at making detectors that can see infrared radiation. Some detectors can even make an infrared video. Bear light. A team of scientists led by Dr. Stephen Amstrup tested the idea of using a warmer spot in a snowbank to tell about a polar bear den underneath. Their infrared video camera was mounted on the underside of a helicopter and pointed at the ground below. The scientists rode in the cabin of the helicopter watching the video screen. The screen was adjusted to show the snowbank below as a gray smear. Any place warmer, like the snow above a polar bear den, appeared as a bright spot against the gray background. Bright spots. From their continued study of polar bears, the team knew about 15 dens with bears that had been fitted with radio collars. While checking these 15 dens from the air, the research team found 11 other warm spots that showed up on our infrared video screens. When the scientists checked those locations, all but three were found to be actual dens. The three false positives were caused by unexpected heat sources. For example, one was a big steel barrel, barrel and another was a boulder that had held a little heat from the previous summer. The 23 polar bear dens were found over and over again. The scientists concluded that infrared video gives a practical way to find and avoid the dens and help polar bears live with people. So going back to the pictures, the illustrations and captions, this one is Dr. Stephen Amstrup of the Alaska Science Center in Anchorage holds a polar bear cub. Its mother was given a drug to make her sleep while researchers checked her health. Then for this illustration here, or this picture. This mother bear wears a collar with a radio transmitter. So this is the collar right here. By tracking the radio signal, 
scientists can find her to learn about her and her cubs. For this one here, the dark bump under the front of this helicopter, so this right here, holds a special camera that can find polar bear dens under the snow. Awesome. Okay, so my question to you, I have two questions. The first one is, how do polar how do mother polar bears make their dens? And the next one is how do scientists track the mother polar bears and their cubs? So based on the information in this magazine, I'd like you to write down on your piece of paper the answers to these questions. So I'll let you pause your video and do that. Awesome, so time to check our work. So for the first one, how do mother polar bears make their dens? Well, mother polar bears scoop out hollow spaces in snowbanks to make dens. And we found that based on our very first sentence. Mother polar bears give birth to their cubs in dens they have made by scooping out hollow spaces in snowbanks. What about this one? How do scientists track the mother polar bears and their cubs? So I found this answer from the caption. Scientists track the radio signals from the collar that the mother polar bear has. The collar has a radio transmitter that sends the radio signals. And again, that's taken from this caption and it's reworded a little bit. All right, so now we've learned about polar bears through this Highlights Magazine article. Now we're going to learn some more from another resource, which is pictures and captions of polar bears. So we have our caption, polar bears live near the North Pole. And that's something that the magazine article did not mention. So this is enhancing our understanding of polar bears. And then this one says, polar bears have very thick fur to keep them warm, even when they are in or by water. So my questions to you are, what do polar bears have that help them adapt to their surroundings? How does this help them survive? So I'll let you pause the video and write down your answers. So now let's review the answers. Based on these captions and the pictures, we get some important information about polar bears. So we know that the North Pole is very cold. I mean, look at all the snow in the background of this, it's super cold. And polar bears thick fur, because they have lots of thick fur, helps to keep them nice and warm. And it says that right here, it keeps them warm and helps them to survive the freezing temperatures and icy winds and water. And we can see like all the ice here and how cold it must be. So their warm fur protects them and helps them adapt to their surroundings. All right, we have one last resource to enhance our understanding of polar bears, and that is pie charts. Okay, so we have population trends of polar bears in 2005. We have this purplish, bluish section, which means stable. So these trends are pretty stable in this area. We also have declining. Then we have increasing, which is the sliver here. And then we have insufficient data right here. Now looking at our population trends of polar bears in 2009, we can see that the majority of these are declining or have insufficient data. A small sliver are increasing and a larger sliver are stable. So I have one question to you. In 2005, which two groups were closest or most similar to each other? A, increasing populations and declining populations. B, declining populations and stable populations. Or C, stable populations and increasing populations. So your job is to look at these pie charts and find out is the answer A, B, or C for the question in 2005, which two groups were closest or most similar to each other? So I'll let you pause the video and find the answer. Now it's time to check our work. If you said B, you are correct. Let me show you why. So the question is in 2005, so right away we know to look that we have to be looking at the right pie chart. So we have population trends of polar bears in 2005, population trends of polar bears in 2009. We know that this one is out. 
because we need 2005, which means we'll be looking at this pie chart right here. Okay, so in 2005 with this one, which two groups were closest or most similar to each other? So A is increasing populations and declining populations. So we've got increasing here, and we've got declining here. So increasing seems like the smallest sliver, and declining seems like a larger sliver than increasing, which means these are not very close to each other. They're not very similar to each other. These are like two completely different amounts. Let's take a look at our next one. Declining population, this one, and stable populations, this one. Well, these look pretty much equal. Declining takes about a fourth of the circle, and stable also takes up about a fourth of the circle. So these look pretty equal. But let's check on option C just in case. Option C is stable populations and increasing populations. Hmm, well comparing the two, stable looks like a much larger piece of the circle than increasing does. So that one must not be an option. So option A and option C must not be options, which means it's option B. Again, declining populations and stable populations. These look like pretty much the same amount. They look like groups that are close or similar to each other. So that's why the answer is B. So just to recap this lesson, our topic was integrating multiple sources. And our learning goal was, I can demonstrate coherent understanding of a topic or issue using information from various media and formats. So again, media and formats being books, essays, videos, pie charts, and a whole bunch of other resources. Okay, and for our agenda today, first we reviewed the vocabulary terms and definitions, and that was of media and formats. Then we integrated multiple sources to increase our understanding of the World War II Navajo code talkers. Then we integrated multiple sources to increase our understanding of polar bears. So our vocabulary term was media slash formats, which is how the content is presented, whether this is presented in pictures, charts, graphs, books, essays, whichever information. And integrating or combining all of these sources of information helps give us a more thorough understanding of the topic. So I hope that you enjoyed today's sixth grade ELA lesson. I know that I certainly did, and I will see you back soon for another one.